So let's look at what are the skills and what are, what are the kind of things you require for each particular component. So EMQ. EMQ is about pattern and word recognition. It's all about what I call buzzwords. So to give you an example, and this is how you study, so it's not about taking a textbook. Remember, at the beginning, fine, go through textbooks. But as you come sort of closer to the exam, and whilst you're reading textbooks as well, what you've got to keep in mind is the buzzwords. So to give you an example, your pattern and word recognition will lead to a mind map. So say for example, you've got one particular cu couple of buzzwords here, accommodation reflex present. Where does that lead to? So ARP, Agar Robertson pupil, right? Syphilis. Now, Accommodation reflex present is not necessarily linked to subcortical dementia, but syphilis is linked to subcortical dementia. That goes into subcortical dementia areas of the basal ganglia. So neuroanatomy comes in. So what are the areas of um, basal ganglia? Corded, putamen, globus pallidus, substantia nigra. And then from there, you would go substantia nigra, Parkinson's, uh, corded, putamen, Huntington's. Huntington's can go into the genetic. What genes? Chromosome 4 what trinucleotide repeat CAG. This is the kind of linking that has to happen because EMQ is about quick recognition. So it's, when, you're, when you're studying, ask yourself, oh, look, I've come across subcortical dementia. What are the different types of subcortical dementias? And what are the key points in each subcortical dementia? So say, for example, EMQ Huntington's. They don't, you don't need to know the whole spiel of Huntington's, right? And they're not going to give you the most obvious thing about Huntington's career. But the kind of questions is CAG, trinucleotide repeats, chromosome 4, right? Um, phenomenon of anticipation, right? Previous, the, it, it can come in each, every successive generation, the onset becomes earlier, the anticipation. So these are the kind of things. What areas? Corded putamen. What scan, particularly? Spec scan. EEG, flattening of the EEG. So these are the. Because you can see EG theme is there in the EMQ. So you kind of have to very quickly know what are the EG findings. And there are not so many. There's only a few. So if you've got CJD, which also can have some subcortical involvement, then you know CJD, what are the words? Periodic, sharp, one to two hertz. So those, that's the kind of linking that you require for the EMQ. Why does that help? Because in clinical practice, when you're doing private or public, small signs, when you see them, uh, small changes very quickly you're able to link to the clinical bit. So for example, if I say you have you seen hyperkalemia on um, serology, what do you think you would think of first? Relevant to psychiatry, what they test in the EMQs, Addison's is something to pick up. So that's the kind of, when you're reading textbooks, have a think about this sort of approach. Okay, so as you see, white matter hyperintensities. The college likes it. Why? Late life depression. That's where it comes up. What type of scan will show this? MRI T2 weighted images. So as I said, Huntington CSF VDRL definitive test for neurosyphilis. So that's the kind of connections that you keep making, and that's what will help you for the EMQs. Okay, so when you are reading a textbook. One of the ways that you, one of the things that you may consider is by getting small posters and just putting the buzzwords there, because at the end, all you need to do is to actually go through those buzzwords. Okay. The next bit is your critical analysis. Now, registrars do find this difficult. There's no doubt about it. Okay, and I think part of the reason is because training isn't there for critical analysis on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a very, very difficult thing to learn say, for example, prepare for it one or two months and then not have any connection with it. It evaporates literally within like, you don't keep in touch for 15 days and it's out. Um, so it is a very, very difficult thing to do. Now, what I would suggest, and if it's possible, is to try to establish a journal club if you can. I know it's, you know, it, it may, may not be possible, but if you can actually do journal club in a way that the exam is 
that's what will help you. So essentially, what I would recommend is if you were presenting at Journal Club, you actually take a paper and you present it in a way where you're actually doing it in a question answer format or set up your, M your MCQ questions yourself. Because that will give you a good understanding of how the examiners think and you only have to do one or two presentations that way. But what that will do is actually allow for that discussion. So you know the answer but you can provide the explanation as well. Now if you're attending the course you will get those papers, feel free to present those papers in your journal club as well. So let's look at this, with this one's actual exam question. Does fetal exposure to SSRIs or maternal depression impact infant growth? Um, and what they do in the exam is give you obviously a table like this and you know people can panic when they see a table like this because you know where do you look, what do you, how do you answer questions related to this that quickly. Essentially the, the trick of course is most of the really really valuable information is on the right hand side because when you're looking at a paper the most important thing that you want to know is is this clinically significant? Two, is it statistically significant? That's what you want to know. Want to know. And overall with the paper what you're trying to figure out is is this paper methodologically sound? And that consists of usually reducing four biases and those four biases differ between different studies so really if I had to summarize critical analysis you are looking at okay what sort of paper is this is it a randomized control trial if it's a randomized control trial I know four biases need to be minimized first allocation bias needs to be minimized second confounding bias needs to be minimized third attrition bias needs to be minimized and fourth measurement bias needs to be minimized Right? And these are the four biases that you have. So what I do is look at where these particular biases are, read the paper and see if they're minimized. Remember something, there's no right and wrong answer here, it's about the quality. Once that's done, you can then put some weight on the results. And you look at the p-value and look at the confidence intervals and you look at the measure of effect. Those are the three things you need. Measure of effect tells you the strength of association. So it tells you, is this clinically significant? You know, is the NMT is four. That's good. So does that mean I can actually use this drug for my patient? The second bit is the p-value and the confidence interval. So p-value is telling you what is the probability of chance. Confidence interval is telling you what's the range if I were to take this particular study and apply it to the rest of the population. Where would the measure of effect lie between. So obviously I won't go into too much detail here because the, the, the aim is not to obviously do critical analysis but to tell you that there are only about four or five questions that are, that are relevant. Are the biases minimized? What type of paper is this? Is this clinically significant? Is this statistically significant? And what's the measure of effect? That's really what you're doing through the paper which is why essentially the skill of appraising a paper in five minutes relies on asking these questions. So try to uh, presented in that format as well. Okay. So the, these are how questions are asked. So it'll say one question is all of the following are advantages of systematic reviews except and you've got to pick the right answer so it's not affected by the quality of studies. That's not true. It is affected by quality of studies because it's the GIGO principle which is garbage in, garbage out. Poor studies, your result of the systematic review or meta-analysis is also poor. Why did the authors choose only randomized control trials? Choose one option only and increases the internal validity of the study because randomized control trial is, you know, all the four biases can be minimized through design. So randomized control trials have good internal validity as opposed to external validity. Okay, so external validity can be improved by making population more generalizable, for example. So look, these are just examples of the kind of questions that can come up, but uh, the, the good thing about critical analysis is a lot of questions won't be that ambiguous. Okay? There are times when that there's a possibility of that, but if you know it, you're actually able to score marks really well. So we've had candidates that have come back and said, you know, I've scored 70, 80 percent on critical analysis, which is possible because if you know the answer, you know it. Okay? But having said that, yes, there are times when 
there are certain questions that may be ambiguous. But ambiguity, remember, will go to the committee and, and it may be taken out.